Hello, everybody. Nice to see you again. So um, we're going to talk about the future of cities. I have um, two invited speakers. Um, I'm sorry about my French. I have Guillaume Lavoie well. on my left. Guillaume is uh, from Canada, Montreal. He's a city councillor and the official opposition spokesperson for finance, government relations, and international relations. And he's interested in transparency, accountability, mobility, and the sharing economy. And to my right, I have Patrick Robert. Robert. <laughs> he's a CEO of SNCF. And he took charge of the 1.3 billion S NCF group business unit in 2014 when the French rail was undergoing a huge restructuration and Patrick station development strategies seeks to combine multimodal transport solutions and you're also interested in the sharing economy and new forms of mobility. So we have two men who are very interested in mobility I see. However we are not only going to talk about mobility when we consider the future of cities my initial question to both of you was if you could imagine the future of cities in 20 years, would you say that in terms of mobility, would you say that we would have a whole system run by autonomous vehicles operated by Uber and Google or a <laughs> flourishing sharing economy that empowers citizens? What is your guess? Well, I'm sure Monsieur Robert would tell you they would un all run on trains run by the SNCF taking La Gare, of course, I would imagine. A train sure, SNCF not exclusively, but train sure. Uh, th that's actually a very tricky question. You know, 20 years from now, I mean, five years ago, I don't think that either Uber or even Airbnb ex uh, existed. Uh, you know, I'm a politician, I think four years at a time. Uh, but. To, to be honest, I think our city should be more and more concerned about mobility as an objective, not as a, not the how. I care, I don't care, I'll put it like this. I don't care on what or where your buns are sitting. I care that those buns are traveling faster, cheaper, easier in the city, either by bike share or autonomous cars, or even your own car with no empty seats, of course, or a bus, or a metro. The idea is that how do I move people around at a much cheaper price, at a much faster pace, with a much lower carbon footprint? That is, I think, what should guide us for the rest. That sounds like autonomous vehicles run by Uber. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. What is your view? Um. I think the key issue is to, to speak about big cities. And when you're in big cities, you have a huge amount of people who need mobility. Um, um, one of the tricky issues in, in big cities without trains or trams or metros, and I was in Tehran a few weeks ago, is traffic jams. So you have to manage both mobility and space in the city. And to, to cope with that kind of issues, um, you have to invent, probably, new ways of um, big system, like trains or others or trams or whatever, but for a large flow of people. The main issue is a large flow of people with a minimum space in the city. If I could just add to that, two little things. Uh, the way we build our cities. You know, we rarely connect the building of our cities and mobility issues. We sort of build cities and then figure out how we'll move these people around. But how you build your cities is very much 90% of the answer what sort of mobility uh, possibilities you'll have. If it's sprawl, then you're just building for problems. If you build uh, denser, better, uh, and if you have cities where you can do your shopping and your work almost in a sort of 10, 20 minute radius, then mobility is a much easier issue to deal with. But you also have to bring the sort of, not taxation, but the pricing of mobility. And to do it in a very dynamic way, you start charging, not by 
uh, by lanes or by means of transportation, but by kilometers that are traveled. And you can move those prices up and down depending on a certain time of day or a certain place in the city. If you use a very quiet street, you may pay a little more. And therefore, you can sort of tweak those behaviors into uh, being better behaviors. Okay, so you raised the issue of, of data, data being meaningful in terms of dynamizing these processes and, and, and controlling and also the pricing and so on. What do you think the future, uh, the future of cities, what do you think data could contribute to us thinking of the future of cities? Um, well, as you said, data will, uh, the, the way people are consuming the cities will change uh, when you can spread the data and share the data with them. So they can use the uh, motorway by night, if it's cheaper by night, whatever. So uh, one of the key issues is to be able to share, to demonstrate people and to make them make their own choice in the city, uh, whatever the need is. And uh, if, we, um, if we look at the consumption of uh, trains, for instance, in Paris or whatever, um, we have got traffic jams in trains two hours a day. On the peak time, mon mon peak time in the in the morning and peak time in the evening. So we have to be able to to spread that on the day. And the best way will be to share data with citizens. Uh, absolutely, you know it's amazing how our cities are sort of running low on in time data. Uh, the more and more, not only do we we cities need to have those data, but those data need to be out there. Uh, you know. Having the data is having the power, and the typical public policy behavior in terms of, it's very rare that you'll see a ministry or a minister sort of giving his power away. But the, uh, the real big push is to have those data available for any and all. And then having people not only develop new apps about it, but being able to, as uh, Mr. Robert said, to be able to act upon it, to decide Will I purchase a house in this place? Or what's the true cost of living here? What's the true cost of transportation from this place to this place? Uh, well, actually, I see that there's a traffic, jack, a traffic jam there. I'll bike share to the next metro station and then get on. Uh, we tend to always figure out what's the best way to, do, to use those data. But I think the really best way is to put those data out there and see how people will use them. Well, uh, yeah. sorry. just one point. What is very, very new in the business for us is the, uh, as you said, the data is the power. And a few years ago, the data was the property of the uh, companies like us, like ours. And now, in every city, in every country of the world, the data is the, um, uh, the power of the city. So the big change between the relationship we have as an operator with, c with cities, uh, it really changed on last year or a few days, a few years ago. So I, I, I do agree with you that data is of significant importance for city management, although we, we know that in most cases Airbnb, for example, and Uber keep the data, and this data will be incredibly valuable for city councils. There are some city councils like in Boston or in Portland where the mayor has said, hey, do you want to operate here? Well, you have to give me your data. Do you envision a future where cities are going to have more strict data codes where these big companies are, uh, have to share this data for the benefit of us all? Or you see that uh, the policy behind this is way too complicated? It's a question for the city. Well, it's certainly twofold. First, uh, what do, and this is almost above city level, but certainly within the realm of government, what do uh, private companies can do with those data. This is something we have to address from a, uh, the protection of private life uh, forefront. But as a city, and I congratulate the city of Boston and the city of Portland, if a city out there is considering making a deal with Lyft or the Ubers of the world or Airbnb, the first thing on your list should not be how much money am I going to get out of this deal, the first thing you should do is how can I fuel my policy making decisions with the amazing number of real time data I can collect from there. I always do that test when I meet a city official. If I had one extra bus, where would you put it in the city? And oftentimes they just don't know. 
but all those uh, ride-sharing companies have amazing data in real time where I could relocate, reallocate scarce resources we have at the city to serve a line that is underserved or to even consider abandoning lines where they are underserved in order to use those buses to the best possible ability. And policy not fueled by data is uh, being guided by uh, a blind man. So not exactly the kind of city you want. Um, as a company, you know that if you unlock your data sets, the data you collect, you are actually contributing to creating an even playground where data-intensive competitors can emerge and provide the service that you provide. Are you as a company scared of doing that or you think that the benefits of opening data that's of public interest outweighs the commercial benefits of a company? No, I would say we are not scared as we are on our side a public company. So it's a very specific kind of company. But we are used to work with cities uh, in, uh, all over the world, in Boston, in uh, Vegas, in uh, uh, Melbourne, on, in all of the cities, the data belongs to the city. And our job is to, to have the um, intelligence to be able to help the city to uh, manage the data and to improve the services. So there is no, no issue for us to, to do that. And I think um, transportation system in cities is a very old system, so we are used to have long-term relationships with cities and it will, it will become the same situation for Uber or Airbnb in a five years' time or ten years' time. They will share the data with the cities, as we are used to do that. Good. Um, we see that mobility has changed immensely due to innovation. Big companies having the power to innovate. For example, Tesla is creating the Hyperloop and it's going to provide a service that it's going to be very hard to compete with. So what is the role of the public, public companies or the public sector and citizens uh, in terms of contributing to innovation in a way that can compete with these big companies that have an innovation potential that we, are, uh, we might struggle to achieve? Uh, it's a very good question. Two, uh, two cities come to mind as some of reference. Uh, first, the city of San Francisco. All the, you know, San Francisco and all the Googles of the world are actually not in San Francisco. They're in Palo Alto, uh, actually not a, a little outside of the city. And uh, didn't have any good public transit available. So each and every company started to put together its own public, its own transit uh, division. And they had those big buses coming in San Francisco, pulling off the street and then driving to the headquarters. At some point, it was clogging the streets and clogging the bus stops. And the city needed to intervene to say, all right, if you want to operate in our city, here's how you'll do it. And by the way, since you're using you, the private company, public space, because you always own the space. That's your real key for power. Then you'll pay us and you'll stop where we feel it's okay. You're not going to clog the streets by using them. Uh, but the, another very good approach is the city of Seoul in uh, South Korea and uh, car sharing companies. Some cities feel that, and I think it's very 1.0 thinking, we need to organize it. We need to own it. We need to create the company in order to have this ride sharing, uh, sorry, car sharing service in Seoul. But I don't believe there is one good company. There is one best company. So the city of Seoul said, look, these are our two main objectives for the public good. First, we have five companies now in, in, uh, in Seoul. You can operate in the city, but you need to figure, figure this out on your own. But your, your key to open the car has to be compatible with the cars of all the other companies. Therefore, making it a super user-friendly uh, initiative for the citizens. And you don't take a car because you prefer this company, although you could. You take the car that's closest to you, which is the very objective of car sharing. And the second thing that they say is, like, you can operate in Seoul, but every year we're going to ask you an uh, additional threshold of a number or percentage of cars that need to be electric. So the city of Seoul doesn't get boiled down into the managing or the creating of a company. A lot of companies out there do have that expertise, but they do 
I call it regulate in order to better permit. The city is the one that has to regulate and it should do it according to the best uh, concerns for the l'intérêt général, so that the general interest of the public, which is more and easier car sharing options. Anything to add? Um, you went far from your question. <laughs> He's a politician. Um, if, I, if I go back to the question of innovation, it's, um, it's a very difficult question for a big company like ours. At the very beginning, when you started to try to uh, investigate open innovation, we invested in startups, and we killed all of them. So uh, on the second step, we started to be customer of startups, and we are still on that way, and we are currently working in different startups, for instance in stations, working with a small startup called Bulldozer, they are based in San Francisco, and they are designing very specific uh, IT system to uh, help to do the maintenance of stations. And so that's a good way to, not to buy innovation, but to, uh, to bring innovation in our company. And, uh, and you gave the example of Hyperloop. Um, but so we are a new stage for us, and we are starting to reinvest in startups, and we decide to invest in Hyperloop to be able to, to learn from them. So it's a very, very different position. We are 250,000 people working in 120 countries around the world, and we are investing in very tiny company just to be able to learn from them and to help them to do their, to do their job, which is to invent a new way of uh, traveling people. So it's, um, uh, it's not easy, but we are very humble on that, and I think we, the only way for us to be able to invent something new, new is to uh, investigate in open innovation. Just quickly on innovation, and, and I'll sort of, uh, uh, sort of condemn politicians, with I being the exception, of course. But here's the, here's the thing. Most of our public policies are, you know, nothing is permitted unless it is allowed. I think if you really want to have a breeding ground for innovation, it, you have to put it completely on its head. Everything's allowed unless it is forbidden. Because if you do the first, you cannot think about all the possibilities of the future. And if you really want to put a politician to the test, because all politicians will tell you that they are in favor of innovation, you know, that and apple pie, it goes together. Ask them the true question behind it. What is your level of tolerance to disruption? And if it's very low, therefore you have a politician that's very, not that open to innovation. If you want to be open to innovation, you've got to roll with the punches. You've got to be a little more tolerant about disruption and the mess that it's going to create and the laws and the bylaws that you have to rewrite. That's just the business of dealing with innovation. Innovation uh, in order and discipline doesn't exist. It has to be disruptive. Um, Guillaume, uh, you have promoted in, in your city an initiative to allow people to privately rent their, uh, the excess capacity of their garage, for example, and promoting new ways of using uh, available spaces. What's been the, um, the level of engagement with that new move that you pushed forward? Uh, it has been a very revealing experience, you know, just to, to take uh, the context of this. Uh, we think a lot of sharing cities in terms of public spaces, but there is a lot of private spaces in our cities. Actually, most of our spaces in our cities are private. They belong to the citizen, to the industries, to the schools, to the church. And how do you approach the sharing of those? And then I discovered that our cities, or our city's bylaws, are almost written to uh, discourage sharing initiatives. Every and uh, is there any urbanists in the room? No. So it's his fault. Uh, the very key of urban the, the 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 religion of urbanists is zoning. You divide the city in function of various usage. You have industrial, institutional schools and whatnot, commercial, and then residential, and Every square foot of a city, chaque mètre carré of a city, has one function and one function alone. It is unique and exclusive. So, for example, if I have a parking spot to my home 
and it's mine. But yet it is zoned with a very exclusive function of residential. If I rent it out, even for one dollar, it becomes commercial in the eyes of the bylaws. Therefore, not allowed. Therefore, discouraged, perhaps even punished. So the idea was to completely do away with that thinking of exclusive usage per square foot. So therefore, you can park at your home, and it's a residential parking, but as soon as you're out go, uh, to go and work, that parking is now available. And I much prefer having a car there than having to build extra capacity of parking all across the city. And we decided to do the same with two other kinds of spaces. Uh, storage, you know, in our cities we have sort of rent a storage place for a month or anything. Imagine what you could do with those spaces, housing, a park, what not, and redistribute those boxes into the garages and the basement of the city. And, there, and the same with the, par the, the, the plot of a backyard for urban agriculture. I can't, uh, I can't answer the demand with just my community gardens. I need more land to cultivate more carrots. So that's the goal. So I, I understand that a garage or a garden is, can be privately owned but to change the dynamics of what is done in those spaces may affect the whole community. So what is the limit be between the private interest of the citizen and the resilience of a community? Let's say if you live in a neighborhood and all of a sudden all the parking spaces are taken by a lot of different cars all the time, the dynamics of your neighborhood might change. So what is your opinion with regards to this tension between empowering the citizen to exploit its assets and also the possibility for community to choosing how they want their life in their neighborhoods to be like, which is not always going to be a matter of making more money. Uh, I think you should ask that question to the uh, to room, to the people in this uh, location. I'd love to actually ask if I could do that and they say that we can do it afterwards. <laughs> okay, Save so you'll do afterwards. For afterwards. Um, what, can, what I can say on my side, I'm in charge of uh, part of a public land, which are stations in cities. Um, what we are currently doing and launching is uh, we we're asking people what they would prefer us to install in stations. You know, a station is a place where you have, in France, 10 million daily visitors. So the, uh, the first job for us is to organize uh, shopping malls in stations. That's a way to make profit. The, may, the way to run these public services. But the stage where we are now is to ask customers, citizens, what do you need in station? So that's another way to do uh, on our side, the job Guillaume is doing in the city, uh, asking people, what are your needs? And we'll try to do the best to provide what you need in your city. Well, just to, to answer the comeback, and then I, I knew that was coming. Uh, the, uh, it was very important to sort of calm the, 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 uh, the worries of citizens will say, well, I'm fine with that parking lot being used for parking, but if you to make this commercial land, I don't want to have a mechanic store right there. You know, you have to think of the nuisance, the noise, and so on and so forth. That's why our friend the urbanist came up, uh, him and all the urbanists before him came up with the idea of zoning, is to preserve a certain way of life, the, qu the quality of life in your neighborhood. That's why we really went through the rewriting of what sort of usage. It's commercial, it can, uh, yes it is residential, but we allow for complementary use that is commercial only for parking, only for storage, and, and with a very small uh, area that could be used for storage, therefore taking out the possibility that it could serve as a, some sort of a, uh, a warehouse for a company and things like that. So we, we make sure, and in your cities, if you're to promote sharing initiatives or policies that are to favor sharing practices, I often say that a small win is better than a big defeat. And so we started small, we started with a lot of guidelines, with a lot of uh, uh, parameters to make sure that it wouldn't take too much space. And in terms of parking, we allowed it only if the parking is accessible directly via the street. We excluded purposely 
the back alleys because then in terms of externalities, the back alleys are where the children play. It's almost an extension of your backyard. We want this to remain small, to remain a place to live, a place to be. And if I turn this into commercial parking, then I'm changing the entire way of life of that street. So that's how you, you really have to find, to, to take your radar and make it really, really narrow to make sure that you can do the right thing without having the negative externalities with it. I am, as you speak, I am imagining this city of the future. And I just got slightly concerned because I imagine this city that is changing all the time based on what people say they want and it's changing from a train station to a shopping center and a parking slot into a garden and so on. But at the same time, if you go back to thinking of what makes cities so special, it's the things that stay there and have stayed there for so long and give us a sense of agency and belonging. Are we not running the risk of getting rid of that and just making this really functional, functional and ever-changing cities and losing some of the things that make cities what they are? Well, I think it's true, and, and very few people in cities realize that. Everything we build, if you're lucky, you're going to be stuck with for a generation. Uh, I'm thinking like Les Gars. All the train stations weren't built yesterday, and now they become a very vital part of the city. How do we reinvent that space? And it's very difficult to change a city overnight. The changes of the city are incremental. The idea is how do you get it right from the first time? And now, as a city, we have power over what we build on private lands, on public lands, and how we can make those accessible. For example, have a shortage of space, yet I have gymnasium and meeting rooms and uh, swimming pools and schools that are unaccessible outside of the time of the school year. So I would love to be able to open that to my citizens at night, on the weekends, and during the summertime. But those weren't built for that. So from now on, everything we build, should we, we should have that mentality that it should be shared use or be uh, able to do that. And when it's a private developer, well, we negotiate. If you want to build that, that extra story up, tell me how much square foot will be dedicated to a sharing space that could be useful for the citizens of the city, that it could be somewhat donated to the cities. Uh, that would be something interesting. Well, if you, get, if you get some postcards of cities every 20 years, you will see it's always moving, always changing. So um, I think it's normal. It's, it's, uh, it's a kind of... Um, living organism, uh, a city. But what we um, need to be very careful of, I think, uh, and I will disagree with Guillaume, we need urbanists. We need urban people to be able to... <laughs> yeah. uh, we need them to be able to, to design the city for the future. So it's a, it's a kind of mix of being able to, to listen to customers, to listen to citizens who are living in, in that place currently, and to be able to uh, have a kind of projection of what the city may be tomorrow. And that's the role of urbanists and the role of politicians when they are leading a city. We only have one minute and 20 seconds and I want to use your time to ask you, with full honesty, to, tell, to share with us what your dream of a future city is. What is that city that you would love to live in and to leave as a legacy to those who are going to come? That's very tough in one minute, 20 seconds. Just no, right. I only have actually half of that. Okay. <laughs> uh, first, I love urbanists. Don't put me in trouble. They are the ones who write the bylaws in my city, uh, and I need them very much. Uh, the city I envision is a city that is based on sharing uh, practices, principles that is more productive, more sustainable, and more entrepreneurial. And that goes from the bylaws to the actual building of the city to our policies on mobilities and usage. Uh, and that we're all animated by this. And here's my call to the We Share movement. Uh, right here, I'm pretty sure there are very few elected officials. And there are very few top-level city administrators. And there are few, very few top-level public servants. The world of their sharing economy is occupied by people who are 
creating an amazing uh, startups, NGOs, and so on. But you guys need to educate us. Because if we don't know what you're, where you're going, if we're not familiar with sharing economy practices, then it's going to be received as an assault on how things are done in the usual way. So consider that you're all evangelists. Pick a politician, pick a tough civil servant, and introduce him, introduce her to this idea of a sharing world, because it's brand new to a whole lot of us. I have five seconds. <laughs> um, I would say the big, we built big cities in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. And we have the same question for 150 years, which is how to make cities uh, citizen-friendly. And that's the key question and the key issue for us. Cities are citizen-friendly. Cities where all want, we all want to live, I guess. Cities where we share. Well, let's get into it. Let's do it. Thank you very much. <laughs>